morning. I trust that you're well. I tried to sprint up the the stage and I was cold because apparently Reverend Kadu tells me that I have a way that I walk up on stage that I walk up on stage like this. <laughs> <laughs> is there any truth to that? This is uh, trying to be self-aware here. Is there any truth? To it? No. Thank you. Kadu should hear that. Uh, the only one who sees that. Indeed, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to bring God's word to us today. John Agagwa is my name. I serve as one of the pastors here. I am married to one wonderful wife and together we've been blessed uh, with a dear daughter who is soon turning one. And so we are very, very grateful to God. But I've, I've noticed certain things as a uh, as, uh, as time has passed by. For example, I've started to notice that uh, my wife is starting to give me instructions indirectly. <laughs> so she takes a baby and then she says, Baba atakuchukua sasa. <laughs> and I'm like, Kamo kona kitu ya kuniambia. Niambie. I don't want to be address you know that's how politicians address each other mm -hmm. you know these politicians have the each other's number but when they want to tell the other person something they will never just call him and tell they will, they will go to a rally somewhere and say mimi nataka kumwambia ule mjama <laughs> so what i'm saying is that uh, pray for my marriage pray for my marriage <laughs> As I said, I have the privilege of bringing God's word to us. Uh, we've been doing a series about Jesus first and prioritizing God above all other things. And today I just want to sort of uh, bring that to a close with a passage that I think communicates uh, properly that particular theme. So would you turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 33? Exodus chapter 33. We'll read uh, the first four verses and then verse 15 and verse 16. Exodus 33 from verse 1 to 4. Exodus is right after Genesis. I've seen some of you where you're opening your, your Bible. That does not look like Genesis. Come on to just two pages after that, two pages after that. Where you are looks like Ezekiel. <laughs> Exodus 33. I read from verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up amongst you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. Verse 15. And he said to them, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, and I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? And that is the word of the Lord. We can never pray enough. So let's pray. Our Lord, we are grateful to you. We thank you for your word. I plead with you, Father, that you would move me out of the way so that you would minister to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The backdrop of our text is Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, you could argue that Israel have manifested the height of their rebellion. They considered that Moses, something must have happened to him. Uh, when Moses went up the mountain, he had stayed for so long, he hadn't come down, and they told Aaron, Aaron, make us a god. We have no idea what has happened to this fella, Moses. 
And the scripture says that Aaron told them, okay, bring your earrings, your ornaments, your golden um, jewelry, and they put them into a cauldron and made up a, 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 a golden calf. And the scripture says that they began to worship it. This was the height of their rebellion. They had done many wicked things. They had been a stubborn people. They had complained against God and against Moses. But at this point, this was the height of their rebellion. This was the height of their sinfulness. We see that sin now has manifested itself, in a sense, fully in the life of these children of Israel. And here's what God says as a result. I will not go up amongst you, lest I consume you along the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. The Lord is speaking to Moses, and he tells him that because of the sin of the children of Israel, I can no longer continue going with them. It can no longer be business as usual. Sin has now alienated the people of God from God. He will no longer walk with them unless, lest, he says rather, that he will destroy them. Now, God is saying that my presence can no longer go with his people because if I go with them, I will consume them. I will destroy the people. And since I don't want to destroy them, I won't go with them. It is clear here, brothers and sisters, that sin serves the purpose that it has always done from the beginning, to alienate God from his people. Before this time, the presence of God was a good gift to the children of Israel. It was the reason why they continued to be sustained and survive in the wilderness. It was because of the presence of God that, that had separated the children of Israel from Egypt when they pursued them, that they were kept safe. It was the presence of God through whom the Holy Spirit blew and made the Red Sea part and so they were able to cross. It was the very presence of God that had protected them from the heat of the day and the cold of the night through their stay in the wilderness. The presence of God had been their sustenance. And now see the wickedness and evil of sin. It has turned that which was meant to be their protection into their destruction. And beloved, sin still does that today in your life and mine. Sin takes that which is good and it turns it fatal. Sin is the reason why there is, sick, there is sickness and poverty and pain in the world. God gave us the good gift of this world and this planet. But when man committed high treason and sinned against God and was alienated from the Garden of Eden, we found ourselves in the place that we have found ourselves with the pain and the suffering and injustice that continues to work in the world. Sin has not changed. It's an alienating factor. It continues to alienate the people of God from God himself. The reason why marriage is so wonderful and so beautiful is because God gave it to us as a good gift. But at the same time, sin often turns a good marriage into a potential war zone where you have to tiptoe into the house because you're not sure what landmine you might step on. Thank God for grace and thank God for his love and mercy. Sin is the thing that turns your job that you prayed for, for God to give you a job. And you are so grateful when you finally got the job. But because of sin in this world, it's not unlikely that one or two people are praying to God, oh God, just change me from this job. Sin turns the things that are wonderful that God gives us into stuff that are frustrating. And that's no different for the children of Israel. What God had given them to be a wonderful gift to enjoy of his presence. Now God says, if I continue going with you, I will destroy you. Because you are a stiff-necked people. But there is something wonderful to consider in this text. Notice what the Lord says to Moses. So he says to Moses, okay, so now the deal is changing. There is a bit of a revision of the plan. We can't go on as business as usual. So here are the few changes that I want to propose. Number one, so I want you to see what God tells Moses that's going to be available for them vis-a-vis -vis what's not going to be available for them. He says, the land that I saw to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you'll still have that. 
That means God is saying you will still have wealth, you will still have possessions, the minerals in the land will be yours, the food in the land will be yours, the barley, the wheat, the pomegranates, the copper and the iron, they will still be yours. The land, the wealth is yours. Number two, you will not go alone. I will send my angel uh, uh, to go with you. That means they will have guidance and they will have direction. They will not be lost in the vastness of this wilderness where it would have been easy to be lost. You will have direction. You will have guidance. You won't have to guess, do we go right or left? I will give you my angel, and my angel will show you the way that you need to go. Number three, I will drive out all your enemies before you. And remember the enemies that he is speaking about here. When they finally met them, they were giants. The scripture says the, the, the Israelites looked at them and they said, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes before these individuals. They had muscles in places they didn't even know muscles existed. And Israel said, we, we can't take this. Now God tells them, that's still in the deal. I'm still going to give you this land, and I'm still going to fight your enemies. You will have military power. None of your enemies will be able to stand against you when you go into this land. And number four, you will have abundance. This land will flow with milk and with honey. What an offer. Wealth, military power, guidance, abundance. Oh, really, Lord, we, we still get all that? Yeah, all that. From face value, it looks like nothing much has changed. But the Lord says, there's only one caveat. I will not go with you. I will no longer be in your midst. My presence will not go with you. One preacher has rightly pointed out that this is the world's dream religion. This is what the world wants. All the gifts and blessings of God without God. You see, when God dwelt in the midst of Israel, it wasn't just a geographic location, it was a symbolic location. God was saying that the reason I want to set up my tent of meeting in the center of the camp is so that you would know that all your lives need to revolve around me. Everything you do need to revolve around me. Now God is telling them, you will go into that land and you don't have to worry. My, te my tent will no longer be in your midst. Your life no longer has to revolve around me. And I will not be present to destroy you. It's the world's dream religion. The world wants to enjoy God's good gifts without God's meddling presence. The world wants to enjoy God's gift of money and wealth without God's responsibility of generosity and service. They want to enjoy God's good gift of sex without the, the unnecessary confines of marriage. They would rather enjoy God's good gifts of power and dominance without the responsibility to serve others. If they got this offer, they would have said, yes, finally, keep your just give us your gifts and keep your distance. You know what the Bible says? Verse 4. When the people had this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornament. They were cut to the heart. The folly of their sin was immediately evident to them. They mourned. The word here is not merely that they were sad or inconvenience. It's that they were deeply grieving a great loss. They mourned. Their leader Moses spoke with the same voice in verse 15. He says, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Oh, what a statement. Have you ever contemplated what Moses is actually saying? Moses is saying, Lord, we would rather live in the wilderness with you than go into the promised land without you. This wilderness was no easy place to be in. 
God called it the great and terrible wilderness. It was full of snakes and scorpions. Moses is saying, Lord, we would rather a life of difficulty with you than a life of ease without you. So if you're not going to the promised land with us, then the promised land is no good to us. Moses is saying to the Lord, Lord, you are the promised land. You are what makes the promised land the promised land. If you're not there, doesn't matter how much gold there is. Doesn't matter if you give us military strength. Doesn't matter if we have direction and guidance. Moses says then, we will stay. And I, I think this is a good point for you and I to take stock and to ask ourselves this question. Would we respond the way the children of Israel responded? Would we accept, if it was the will of God, a life of difficulty with him and give up a life of ease without him? Would you rather have a wonderful, well-paying job without God or be jobless for the rest of your life, struggling to make ends meet, but with God? Would you rather, beloved, be single and the struggles of singlehood that that comes with, but with God? Or be married and enjoy the gifts of marriage without God? Beloved, it's important for us to take stock of our lives. In what area of your life are you content with the promised land without God? Oh, I plead with you, run back to the wilderness. For indeed, in the words of David, it is better to be a doorkeeper in the presence of God than to be rich in the tents of the wicked. It is little wonder Proverbs 16 verse 8 says, Better a little with righteousness than great gain with injustice. Better, in Psalms chapter 37 verse 16, a little that has righteous, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Oh, indeed, it is better to be with God in the wilderness, beloved, than it is to be without him in the promised land. But then at this point, a good question would be, why is that so? Why is that the case? You're correct in asking, is this a worthy exchange? You see, Moses tells us why he thinks this is a worthy exchange. Notice in verse 16, he says, if your presence will not go with me, with us, do not bring us up from here, verse 16. He says, for if you don't go with us, how shall we be distinguished from the rest of the world? How shall we be distinguished? What will be the difference between us and the rest of the world? You know what Moses is saying? For the first part, Moses is concerned that the people of God ought to be distinguished, ought to be different from the rest of the world. Moses is not, look, is not looking to be like the rest of the world. He's looking to be distinct from the rest of the world. It is a sad reality that we live in a day and age when many churches, local and international, are doing their best to look a lot like the world in the name and the guise of inclusivity, that we want everybody in, so we need to look as much like the world so that we win everybody. Beloved, God did not ordain it like that. The church was only going to be impactful to the world if it stops looking like the world, if it is distinguished from the world. And Moses says, I don't, what will distinguish us? But the second thing we notice what Moses means. Moses is saying to God, Lord, if you give us military strength, and you give us wealth, and you give us power, and direction, and abundance, what will be the difference between us and the rest of the world? You know what Moses is saying? He's saying, Lord, you give that to the rest of the world too. The rest of the world has military strength. The rest of the world has abundance. The rest of the world has power and guidance and direction. The rest of the world has success. There will be no difference between us and the rest of the world. If you take your presence from us, what will distinguish us? You see, the reality and truth is this, that sometimes we tend to think that the things that distinguish us are the gifts that God gives. But beloved, the gifts of God do not distinguish the people of God. After all, the scripture is clear. He says he makes his reign to, to fall on both the good and the, right, and the unrighteous. He makes his sun to shine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. 
That the sun is shining on you is not proof that you're godly. That the rain fell on your garden when you planted is not proof that you're godly. That you put your hands to a business and it worked out is not proof that you're godly. God gives all those good gifts to people. You know, I had somebody say once that, um, that uh, you, 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 you don't need God to be successful because the most successful people in the world don't even believe in God. And I thought to myself, that's not true. Not that they don't believe in God. I, I mean, they probably do not. I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. The part I'm disputing is that their success didn't come from God. No, their success came from God. Whether they acknowledge him or not is inconsequential. It came from God. Didn't you, don't you remember Nebu? You might know him as King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Nebu became great in the land. The scripture says that he was, he, they, 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 they called him God of God, Lord of Lord, King of King. He became great. He had great wealth. He's probably the one who built the wonder of the world, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon. He was great. Yet, one day when he started to talk somehow, somehow, the Lord showed up and told him, Nebu, I, have, I am the one who's made you what you are. Nebu was not a believer in God. Nebu had never read the Bible all his life. He never even acknowledged God. And God said to him, I am the one who has made you king of kings. The authority you have in the world, I am the one who has given you. The wealth you have, I am the one who has given you. Nebu agreed and says, yes, I accept. A few months later, he was looking at his kingdom and, uh, and he forgot. And he says, see what my hand has made. God said, ah! The Bible says that he banished him to the forest where he was for seven years so that he would learn that all that he had had come from God. The point I'm making is this. Even the wealth of the wicked and the prosperity of the wicked comes from God. God, the gifts of God are not the things that distinguish believers. And that's one of the biggest problems with the materialistic gospel. Because the materialistic gospel goes telling people, come to God and he will give you a house. Come to God and he will give you a car. Come to God and he will give you all these things. Wait until you meet the one who already has a house and a car and all those things. And say, okay, so what will your God add to me? The things of this world and the presence of God are not what distinguishes the people of God. And Moses knows this full well. And so he says, Lord, if you don't go with us, there is nothing to distinguish us from the people of the world. Beloved, beware of confusing the, the blessing of God with the presence of God. The blessing of God doesn't always equal the presence of God. And here's a good saying. It is God's presence, not God's presence, that distinguish the people of God. And you see, oftentimes when you and I look at people who have been blessed materially, we look at them and we say, Surely God is with them. And then we look at our own lives and we say, now, me. But the reality is this. Now, please don't get me wrong. That's not to say that those gifts are not from God. Of course they are. In fact, it's important for me to say this. It is great to receive the good gifts of God. Oh, but beloved, it is far greater to have the presence of God. And so if we ever have to choose... May we have the wisdom that God gave the children of Israel in this moment to choose God and his presence and shun his gifts if his gifts come at his expense. Let me ask you, is this your conviction? What is it that you believe distinguishes you? Is it the presence of God? Or is it the presence of God? How much does it mean to you that God's presence is with you? 
Remember, David cried out when he sinned against God. He said, Lord, let you be counted righteous with all the judgment and whatever action you take on account of my sin. May you be judged righteous in your actions. It's okay. Whatever you want to do with me, do with me. It's fine. You want to take the kingdom? Take it. You want to take my life? Take it. Whatever you do, it's okay. Whatever action you deem necessary for the injustice that I have committed against Uriah and his wife, Lord, do whatever you may, but take not your Holy Spirit from me. Is that your consciousness? Is that your cry? Is that your plight? No wonder he's the one who said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in your house. But at least I will know I have your presence than to be prosperous and great and mighty and to not have God. Oh, and let me tell you the truth, beloved. It might not look like so right now, but envy the sweeper who has God and not the billionaire who has not God. Because one day, one day, the curtains will be opened and history will be brought to a close. And the Bible says in that day, I will show the difference between those who serve the Lord and those who serve him not. You do not want to be amongst those who served him not. It is indeed great to have the gifts of God, but it is far greater to have the presence of God. The scripture says when Israel had this, they mourned. And the question is, how did they come to this realization? Two things. They had the truth concerning their sin, but they also had the truth concerning God's grace. In verse 4, the Bible says, when the people had this disastrous word, when they had the bad news, what was the disastrous word? When Moses looked them in the face and told them, God has said, you are a stiff-necked people. You see, this was an agrarian community. That phrase, stiff-necked, it's actually a phrase that farmers would use when they were trying to plow the, the garden with the, with the oxen. They would put yoke on the oxen and they would try to, to, to plow with the, with the oxen. And if you wanted the oxen to move faster uh, or turn, you... you, you you sharpened what was called an ox god, uh, G-O-A-D, and it had a sharp spike. And what you will do is that you will uh, you would prick the, the the limbs of the of the ox as it as it moved. Uh, if you wanted it to pick up speed, or you will prick its neck if you wanted it to turn direction. And it usually worked. But every so often, you would come across an oxen that did not respond to the pricks. You'd prick it, and it still goes. You prick it, it still goes. It wouldn't turn. And they would refer to that particular kind as what? As a stiff-necked oxen. It was a stiff-necked ox. So a stiff-necked ox was basically the one that was not doing what it's meant to do based on the prompting of its master. And God is telling the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I have been prompting you and trying to move you and trying to get you to go into the right direction, but you never do. And they understood what God meant. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. Before ever they had and knew about the grace of God, it was important that they had and understood about the sin of man. We live in a feel-good society where anybody who tries to tell us of our sin and the ways in which we have fallen short of the glory of God is deemed a, a, a party pooper, a killjoy. We would rather heap to ourselves, as a culture generally, heap to ourselves teachers who will tell us wonderful and nice things about us. But the truth is this. If Moses was unwilling to tell the children of Israel the truth as it came from the mouth of God, that you are a stiff naked people, we will not have seen the repentance that we saw. And sometimes I say, thank God for the Nathan in your life that is willing to come to you like he came to David. And he said to David, David... You are that man. And arguably, Nathan saved David's relationship with God. Thank God for Peter, who looked at the Jews right in the eye, and he says, this same Jesus, whom you crucified by the help of wicked men, God has made Lord and Christ. And because of that, some 3,000 Jews were brought to Christ. Beloved, 
Before we hear the good news, it is important that we hear the bad news. If you're here and you're not a Christian, then you must know that the disposition of God toward you is the disposition that God had towards the children of Israel. The scripture says that those that believe not, the wrath of God abides on them. You are in danger of God's wrath because you have sinned willfully against him. And if you're here, you're a Christian, and you are courting sin, you're flirting with sin, you're not dealing with sin in your life, you are not awakened to the righteousness of God. God is imploring you, do not be a stiff-necked people. It is important that somebody is willing to lovingly tell us. That indeed we have many times bribed our way into jobs or forged documents to get certain jobs or lied to sell a product faster, knowing full well that God will not approve. But because in that moment it was more important for us to get what we wanted than it was to please God. We must hear that we have chosen oftentimes to ignore the word of God on marriage and covenant and chosen rather to simply move in together because it's expedient even though it was more because it was more important for us to have someone with us living with us than it was to follow and obey God's word. We must hear that we have indeed chosen deliberately often the path to get children out of wedlock to deal with our loneliness instead instead of waiting for God's time and struggling with him in the battle of waiting. We must indeed hear that we have many times chosen the unscrupulous business deal that relegated God to the backside. We must hear that we have sinned against God and replaced him with other gods. We must hear that we have loved his presence more than his presence. We must hear that God is right to destroy us should he be willing, should he desire to do so because we have rightly become an affront to his holiness. Beloved, the good news first starts with the bad news. But that's not all that they had, and that's not all that we must hear. Because the truth is that they also had concerning the grace of God. When you read chapter 32, here's what you expect. When you see how they have built up a calf, they have ignored God, they have worshipped this calf, you expect chapter 33 to begin like this, and God destroyed the people. And they were no more. No. The Bible says, I will keep the covenant I swore to Abraham. The good land I will still give you. The covenant is still intact. Beloved, marvel at the goodness and the grace of God. That he is still willing to give them the promised land. That the deal is still on the table. You would have thought that the plans of God for Israel would have been destroyed because of their stiff-neckedness and their rebellion. But no. No. The plan is intact. Are you here, beloved? And you have sinned, and you're seeing, and God is opening your eyes to see that you have sinned, to see that you have turned against him. You can't remember the last time you prayed. You have literally forgotten and no longer have a real and personal relationship with him. And you just feel like, ah, you know, I really don't consider myself a Christian. I think I'm godly, but I don't really think that I'm a Christian. I've lived in sin. I have continued to sin against God. And maybe you think that God gave up on you. Will this story encourage you? I don't, I don't think you are as, sti- as stiff-necked as the children of Israel, and yet God did not give up on them. The plan was still intact. It reminds me of Jacob, right after he had lied to his father, really torn apart his family, right after he had done that, God moved and met with Jacob in the wilderness, and he said to him, Jacob, I will never leave you nor forsake you until I have accomplished all my word for you. Because he who began a good work shall indeed bring it to completion. God will not leave you, beloved, until he has finished all and accomplished all his work toward you. Moses understood that God was gracious. Notice his prayer. He says, if we have found favor in your sight. He doesn't say, Lord, if we have earned favor, because his favor cannot be earned. Moses acknowledges that we are still a stiff-necked people, we are still a sinful people, but we are imploring your grace and your mercy. And that is your and my foundation. 
We do not go to God with the goodness of our righteous deed, showing him, look what we have done. See what we have established. No, we go to him as broken individuals, unable to pay our debt and say to him, Master, I pray that you will receive me back into your household, not because of any good things that I have done, but because you are a gracious and a compassionate God. And if you will turn back to him, if you will walk through those doors again, proverbially speaking, you will find that his arms are always open and he never wants for God to think about you. See the holiness of God when he says to them, I cannot go with you because if I go with you even for one moment, I will destroy you. And see the grace of God and how he has persevered with you and I, not just for one moment, for years. Because he is a gracious and a compassionate God. And the scripture says in verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God relents from his fierce wrath and says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And I've asked myself, what, what changed? What, what changed? Did the stiff necks of the children of Israel suddenly become soft? Oh no, I will tell you what changed. It's not something that changed really. Notice verse 1. He says, depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. God says, you know why I will continue to go with you? Because of the covenant I made with Abraham. In the end, my relationship with you is governed by a covenant that was made long before you were born. And if you want to understand this covenant, you have to go to Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, the scripture says that Abraham was really struggling with God. He was wondering, God... You've been telling me this thing about a kid, a kid, a kid. You'll give me a kid, you'll give me a kid. And I don't have, you, no, you've been telling me you'll give me offspring, offspring, offspring. They will be great, they will be in the land. I am not even have one kid. And the Lord says, Abraham, bring to me Hepha and, and these certain animals. And the Lord, Bible says that Abraham brought them because Abraham knew that God was about to establish a covenant with him. In those days, the way that you established a covenant was that you took those particular animals and you cut them in the middle, you kill them and cut them in the middle, and then you, you made sort of an aisle with their body parts. And then the one person would walk from one side and the other person would walk from the other side and then you would meet in the middle and you would embrace. And once you embrace, you are declaring that if I miss, if I if I, if, I don't put, if I don't keep my bargain, if I don't keep my end of the bargain, of the covenant, then let what has happened to these animals happen to me. Let me become a carcass. Let me be torn apart. And so was the other person saying. So when Abraham knew, God told him to do that. He knew exactly. You see this story in Genesis chapter 15. He knew what God was saying. God was saying, Abraham, you want to be sure that I will keep my covenant to you? Okay, then let's do an official covenant. And so the Bible says Abraham put them, and Abraham was ready to walk to the half part and to meet with God midway. But just after he had finished creating the isle, the Bible says God caused a deep sleep to fall unto Abraham. And so Abraham slept, and then the scripture says God came, and he passed, and he got all the way to the middle. You know what God was saying? He was telling Abraham, Abraham, if I don't keep my word to you, if I don't sustain this covenant, if I ever get back from what I promised you, then let what has happened to these creatures happen to me. I don't think Abraham was very moved by that because after all, God was not going to get back on his word. It's not like God is in any danger at this point. But then Abraham saw the most amazing thing because God doesn't step, stop there. He walks on to the rest of the path that Abraham was supposed to walk. And he's telling Abraham, Abraham, if you don't keep your end of the bargain, if you break the covenant, I will be destroyed. I will take the responsibility for your error. And at this point, I don't know what went through the mind of Abraham. Beloved, and the Bible shows us that Abraham himself, 
and the descendants of Abraham year after year after year after year. They will keep disregarding and being unfaithful to the covenant. So much so about 2,000 years from that moment, God finally came and said, Abraham, your descendants cannot keep the covenant. And so I must walk the last part. And I wonder, how was an infinite, indestructible, all-powerful God going to be destroyed? He had to be born in a manger and become man. And he would walk vulnerable on this planet, teaching people and loving them. And eventually we would do to him what Abraham did to those animals. And God was basically saying to you and I, you know why I can walk with you and not destroy you? Because I took the destruction that should fall upon you, upon myself. I have paid it all. So that when Jesus was on that cross and he cries out, he says, it is finished. He is saying, the route to the presence of God has been opened yet again. That's why the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. The Holy of Holies was open. Whilst before this time, the Bible says that it was difficult to get into the, promise, into the presence of God. In fact, you never just walked into the presence of God. Only the high priest could go in and it was only once a year. And he had to make sure that he was absolutely spotless because if he had even one sin, he would die. And so they would tie a rope around him and pull him out in case he was there too long because nobody else could go in. The Bible says, but in the New Testament, we have not come to a mountain that trembles, that's burning, that's filled with gloom and darkness, that's speaking a voice that even those who heard it said, we cannot bear it, we will not hear it. That Moses himself, who was the most holy person in that congregation, was deeply afraid and trembled as he went up the mountain. The Bible says, no, in the New Testament, we are come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the place of the firstborn, to myriads of angels. The Bible says we are come to the firstborn who, whose blood speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Why? Because the blood of Abel said, Lord, I want vengeance. But the blood of Jesus Christ cried out, Lord, show them mercy. Beloved, what is my message today? It is that you do not have to wallow in sin. You don't have to think that God has boxed you and that he is no longer with you because of your sin. You can turn to God and his arms are wide open. And the reason that God can walk with the children of Israel is the same reason that God can walk with you and I. Because God has taken upon himself the destruction that is due you and I. And so we have full access to the presence of God. So the scripture says, he says now, he says come boldly to the throne of grace so that you may obtain mercy to help in the time of need. Are you here and you're not a Christian? Run to God for his mercy because his arms are wide open and your judgment and punishment was laid upon Jesus and you need not be afraid of him. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins against them. So turn to Jesus and be saved. But if you're here and you are a believer and you have been slacking in your walk, you have been flirting with sin, you have, been, you have been discouraged because of the struggle of sin that you're experiencing, would you run to this same God and say, Lord, I don't come to you because I am perfect or anything. I don't come to you because I have kept your word. I come, be to you. I come before you because I know that you are a good and a gracious God and you have taken the pain and you have paid the debt that I owe you. So despite my sin, I can come before you boldly and receive abounding grace to enjoy your presence wherein there is pleasure ever. Let us pray. Our Lord, we are grateful for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you love us despite our sin. We thank you that, Lord God, you have taken responsibility for the sins that we have committed. Communion reminds us that your body was broken, but that meant that the covenant was fulfilled. So I pray for those who do not know you. Would you draw them to yourself? But I pray for those of us that are weak and fallible and keep falling and struggling with sin that we will remember the message of the cross, that you hold us up and you move us forward 
not because of the righteous works which we have done, but because of your grace that you have demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus. These things we ask in the name of our Lord. Amen. Thank you.